All right, everyone. Thanks so much for joining today's TAM Lab number 94, using VMware Workstation as a lab environment. My name's Bill. I'm going to be walking you through this lab today. And so real quick, uh, if you're checking this out on YouTube and you're a TAM customer, you can submit a session idea. Just reach out to your TAM and let them know what you're looking for, and we can uh, work on making that happen for you. Now, this is the uh, like one of two slides that we're going to run through. And this is such an important principle for using VMware Workstation. It's extremely capable and can do a lot of really good things. But it uses resources from your running computer. So that's going to be CPU, memory, storage, network, or even physical devices if you tell it to. And I've seen this online as people are trying to figure out what is this workstation thing and trying to troubleshoot it and use it and, and everything else, not realizing that it runs on your Windows or Linux or Fusion runs on your Mac, right? And it's going to share those same resources. So um, by running workloads in workstation or Fusion, you can actually degrade the performance on your machine and flip flop that around by doing other things on your on your workstation you can actually degrade the performance of the virtual machines here so i want to call that out right away um right off the bat because i think that's really important principle to what we're doing right we're sharing resources with everything else that's going on on our computers and then the second slide here is to the lab because PowerPoints get kind of boring. So let's go ahead and just kill it and go straight to the lab. So again, so this is uh, this is VMware Workstation. Uh, it's meant to run you know, virtual machines, not in prod, right? This is more like lab or evaluation or uh, dev kind of work. Uh, running this on a workstation, you know, workstations typically go up and down, shut off for the weekends and whatever else. You don't want this being a production environment. And so what you can see here, right, I have a handful of virtual machines in uh, on the left, organized by some folders. You know, you can go ahead and figure out what makes sense for you. For me, you can see I have some TAM lab stuff, I have some home lab infrastructure and uh, other things here. Now, one of the most important concepts to kind of wrap your head around here is the networking side of this. I think we get how a virtual machine works, especially like a standalone virtual machine. And we'll walk through setting one up here in a second. Um, but the networking is really, really interesting. So let me go ahead and show you that. So if we go up to edit in here and go to virtual network editor, this is gonna hopefully clear some things up for some people. Um, I'm gonna immediately start by going to change settings. There's a, a higher level of settings that we can open up here um, with administrator privileges. Let's let that load here. Sometimes it hides in the back. So we have multiple network options available to us um, at, through Workstation. And so you can see a bridged network. So the bridge network is going to be um, as though that virtual machine lives at the same level as your workstation on your network. So think about like your home network and you were to go plug in like an Xbox or something, right? You're going to get an IP address at the same level as wherever your, your laptop is plugged in or Wi-Fi into. So it's a peer. We also have a NAT network. So the NAT network means that your, um, your virtual machines are going to live on a network that's inside of your host but shares your host's IP address. So similar to like more of a corporate network or even your home network, right? Where everything sits behind your router and shares that router's IP address um, as you go out to the internet. The other option here is a host only network. So host only networks live inside of your, your computer, right? Inside of VMware workstation in your, in your laptop. And there's no connectivity outside of that. It's isolated inside of your host. And so thinking about what are you trying to accomplish with this environment, right? How are you going to place your virtual machines, right? The network is going to go ahead or this virtual network is going to be your key to making sure that happens. Now, touching on the bridge network again, there's no option for DHCP right? Or 
well, much else because it's sitting on the network. It's going to rely on your network services you have at your house or in your office to provide that IP addressing. When you go to NAT and host only, now you can start doing things like um, setting up uh, the subnet using DHCP. And if you're NATing, you can actually go through it and you can NAT uh, ports just like you could on you know, a more traditional router, which is pretty cool. So we're gonna go ahead and start walking through a little bit, you know, kind of deploying a VM, but then also some different architectures here. So give me one second. Um, let's take a, oh yeah, I apologize. There's one more thing I wanna show you here. Let me go back into virtual network editor. Okay. Um, there is the con of a concept of a host virtual adapter. The idea behind that is your workstation, your laptop or whatever this is installed on can have a virtual network adapter that lives in that subnet. So the idea is from your host, you can ping, right? Because it's a member of that subnet. So for example, here you can see I have for my host only network, VMNet1, my machine has an IP address there. For my network, network, same thing. For this host only, same thing. For VNet11, it does not. Um, so if I were to pull up, do an IP config here real quick, you can see these virtual network adapters, VMNet1, 8, and 12. And if I come back here, 1, 8, and 12. I do not have a virtual network adapter for VMNet 11. So in the instance you're deploying a virtual machine to a host, host only network that is contained entirely within your laptop or your desktop or wherever this is installed, your, your machine can still get to it. You can still open up the web interfaces or make the database calls or whatever else from that host network knowing that that virtual machine can't get anywhere else. So important concept. Um, hopefully, hopefully this helps as you're thinking about how do I use this thing? Helps you understand the relationship between networks and the host itself and some architectures there. Okay, so next up, let's go ahead and do something kind of uh, 100 level. Let's go ahead and deploy um, a virtual machine here. So I'm gonna go up to new virtual machine. And we're gonna go ahead. I, I typically go through advanced. Um, I don't mind answering the questions because I think I think it's good for context. So here, you know, we're selecting a compatibility of hardware or of workstation 16. Um, I'm not planning on moving this workload to a, a vSphere environment. So it's totally fine with Fusion and workstation. Let me go back here real quick. If I were to select a lower level right here, ESXi 7 compatibility, you can see it can move. 15 lets you do older versions. So you can see you need to understand what you're trying to accomplish here, right? If I did ESXi 6.7, now you can see that this VM is portable to, you know, our, our uh, more enterprise hypervisor, right? Uh, next up, you can uh, select the operating system install. You know, you're gonna give it an ISO, for example. If you select an ISO, um, like let's say this Linux one here, it's gonna use easy install, which asks you some questions and it kind of rushes through the install. I'm not gonna go ahead and do that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, install the OS later and you'll see what that looks like. Um, this VM is gonna be uh, an ESXi host. So you can virtualize uh, uh, the hypervisor, right? Which is so useful for a, a lab environment. Alternatively, you can pick Windows, right? And you have, all of these different flavors, all the way down to 3.1, right? Linux, all different kinds of distributions uh, and architectures. Um, other, if you really want to get exotic, maybe some e-com, I don't know. <laughs> Not sure who's doing that, but hey, it's there. And then ESX with our different versions here. So I'm going to go ahead and do ESX 7. We're going to name it. Now you'll notice here that it, this is where, you know, we're talking about using the same disk, right? As your, as your workstation. 
So here it's going to save them in under uh, C VMs and then the name of my virtual machine. If you have alternative storage set up, maybe it's uh, you know a USB um, hard drive or something else. This is where you can specify like dump them here. Next up, we're going to figure out how many processors um, we want to assign for a lab and what I'm trying to accomplish here. Maybe two processors. You know, two CPUs for ESXi is enough. It probably isn't if you want to run workloads, nested workloads in there, but we're going to go with it. Uh, and I'm going to give it four gigs of RAM. Here we can pick some of the different network options. I'm going to go ahead and keep NAT. Storage controller, right, disk type. Um, I'm going to create a new virtual disk. Although look here, you can actually look at existing ones or other physical disks. There's a little complexity here on why you would use some of these other ones. So we're just gonna create a new one. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and for me, keep the recommended 142 gigs. Um, I'm not checking the box here for allocate space now. So it's gonna be thin provision, right? It's gonna grow as we add data to it and not allocate the entirety of it. And then I'm gonna split it into multiple files. Bill, what's the advantage of spreading it to multiple files? Um, if you spread it to multiple files, you could see, uh, on one hand, it's, I mean, it says it here, right? It makes it easier to move the, 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 the VM to other machines, um, but it may reduce performance with large disks. I personally, when I was on, a, um, on spinning, like on a you know, traditional H, uh, hard drive, I found this was actually made a difference. Um, I would actually keep it here. But since I'm on um, SSDs, I keep the default. I, I'm not entirely sure if there's anything else, if anybody else has uh, a thought on why that would be better. OK, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the name of the disk. I don't care. I'm going to leave it as default. So we're ready. If we wanted to, we can go customize our hardware here. Right, so we can, ah, you know, I, I made a mistake. I want it to be uh, four CPUs, right? Um, or whatever else. I'm also gonna come in here real quick and I'm gonna select the ISO, right? Earlier, I said I was gonna, I was gonna select that later. Let's go ahead and do it now. Um, it keeps a memory of the last handful of ISOs you've used, which is really, really nice. Otherwise you can browse. Um, so I'm gonna pick just one uh, version seven that I have. The other thing that gets people caught up, and this happens even on the vSphere side, is device status. Um, if you're not careful, you can select an ISO, but it's not connected. And then you start losing your mind. Like, I swear, I gave it an ISO. Is the ISO broken or things of that nature? No, you probably just forgot to check the box. So here, connect it power on. If we look at the network adapter, thinking about the conversation we just had about networks, um, you have the option of specifying a virtual network, right? So you can see here some host onlys, we have my one, eight, and 12. But um, you, know, you can have multiple host only networks, right? If we look here, it says host only, which one's it gonna pick? I don't know. Um, so I'll go ahead and select a, a virtual network here. Again, this is more down to your virtual network architecture. If you wanted to, you could add additional hardware types in here. I know people want to pass through maybe GPUs or other things. Um, each one of those comes with its own considerations. So be very careful on what you try and pass through. Um, you might be successful or you might not. Um, but you can do that here. So let me go ahead and hit close and finish. And now we see ESXi show up. I'm gonna go ahead and drag it over here and organize it into TamLab. And let's just start that real quick. Now, earlier I mentioned, you know, we're sharing resources. So here's my, uh, here's my resource manager over here. I'm just gonna bring that up and I'm gonna leave it here as we do some of these things in the lab, we can kind of see what's going on, um, you know, and, and what could possibly impact um, the performance here. So I'm sitting at 
uh, using 52% of my CPU, 23 gigs of my 32, and I have all of these VMs running. I'm also using Zoom. I have PowerPoint still in the background. Chrome's a bit of a memory hog. So I have all of these things going on that could um, affect the performance here. So what we're looking at here, right, is the, the console of the machine. And you notice my mouse, it's a little white or the uh, yellow hand moving around. <clears throat> it's currently sitting in my Windows operating system right now. If I were to click inside of this box, now my mouse and keyboard input are directed into the VM. So again, something I hear from people, you know, customers or even online, like where'd my mouse go? <laughs> um, it's, it's currently directed in there. If you hit control alt on your keyboard, it comes back. So about I'm here in Windows, now I'm on Workstation. Back and forth and back and forth. If you have uh, VMware tools installed, like let's say you're running Windows and you have VMware tools installed, you'll be able to fluidly move your mouse back and forth um, easier. It's smart enough to know when you left the, the little boundary of your virtual machine here. So let's go ahead and just finish this install real quick and we can use this here later. So you can see here my 142 gig drive that I specified, you know, it's gonna be thin with a whole bunch of little files. I'm gonna go ahead and select that, keep my keyboard. Cool. And we're gonna repartition it and go. So I'm gonna hit F, uh, F11 here and if anybody's done, you know, anything with vSphere, this is very comfortable screen to see. I think we're, we're accustomed to that. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and let that finish in the background and let's talk about the network, right? So we've talked about having these different networks, these four networks here, my machine lives, uh, has a, an interface on these. Now we just added this ESXi host. And when it starts up, oh, actually, we're going to make a change to it because I had it on NAT. So let's let this finish. And I can actually, we might be able to do it right now. Settings. Network adapter, right? So I want it on VMNet 12. Perfect. Change it behind the scenes. Okay. Let's go ahead and hit enter. It's going to reboot. So next up, let's take it a step further and let's talk about a home lab infrastructure that could be really interesting, right? Where, you know, this ESXi host is an example of um, running a single virtual machine that can do a thing but maybe you wanna have a set of infrastructures um, that's a little more service enabled, a little more enterprise, right? So next thing I wanna do here is talk about, um, well, let's look at a router. I leverage PFSense, right? Um, for a number of functions. I don't need to be a full enterprise. I don't need to worry about some of these things, but I need something that is pretty easy to use that I don't have to be really like ramped up in um, to understand. So I'm using PFSense, the community edition. So if I go ahead and go to uh, the settings here, let's take a look at what we're looking at. The key here is I have three network adapters. I have my, we'll call it the WAN interface. I'm gonna go ahead and drag this down just a little bit. I have the WAN interface, so that's going to be on my NAT. So it's going to leverage my computer's IP address to get out publicly. Um, and then I also have a LAN um, and then an OPT, right? I mean, effectively, it's a DMZ. And so these are sitting here on these two host-only networks. So if we go back and look at this diagram, 
right? We can see the router exists on the DMZ, on the NAT, and then on the internal. And then I have a domain controller and DNS server sitting over here. So let's look at this. Come on. There we go. So you can see it's sitting on uh, VMNet 12, the host only network. Host only network. And so this exists. I, now I've done a previous TAM lab on this one. It was, I want to say it was TAM lab 19 um, on alternative Active Directory uh, domain services. So this is a Linux server running some before, uh, set up as a domain controller. So that hand, handles AD's uh, Active Directory domain services and DNS. Let me get logged in here real quick. Okay, so um, from here, uh, we can see, you know, 53 is open and, and things of that nature, right? Some of the ports here for Active Directory. Um, and if we do a... Uh, Tamlab.info. So this is serving a domain called tamlab.info. And I can leverage Active Directory, um, like the snap in for uh, administrative tools to, to handle DNS and create users and things of that nature. So now any machine, if I were to configure it, so this ESXi host, let's go back to it. Right, we can see it joined up and I got some DHCP information from my virtual uh, PFSense here. Let me pull this up, excuse me. So here's my PFSense. And if I look at status, DHCP leases, here we go, 192.202. So by deploying this virtual machine, this ESXi host into the host only network where PFSense is existing and PFSense is providing DHCP and, and DNS that now I can make use of all of those services, which is really, really cool. Is this driving so far with everybody? Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Um, oh, uh, there's a question in chat here real quick. Can you highlight the hardware configuration of your physical host? Oh yeah, no problem. Um, so let's see here. I should be able to come here and this might help. Here you go. So I have, um, oh, there we go. Four cores, eight logical processors on my i7. I have 32 gigs of RAM. I have a one terabyte SSD. Um, I do have a GPU um, internal. Whether or not it helps, it's hard to say. And then I have Wi-Fi and some networking. Oh, and then um, next question. What is the Windows OS build version minimum required? That's a really good question. I'm running 6.0, sorry, I apologize. I'm running VMware Workstation 16.1. So we'd have to check the release notes to see, but the same principles have existed for multiple versions of it with virtual networks um, and resource sharing and things of that nature. So um, I'd just say, let's default to the uh, release notes uh, for the version there. Oh, and then we have another, uh, another comment here real quick, just when using Mac uh, and Fusion, it's very slow. Uh, is it a fusion issue? Hard to say. Um, it really depends on what's going on on your machine and what the, the actual configuration is of it. Um, it could be. I've, I have uh, coworkers that have a very performant fusion install. So I guess your mileage might vary there. Okay, perfect. So here we are just chatting about, I have a router here and some DNS uh, and a domain controller providing services. And again, we saw that with the ESXi host that is actually using those services. 
Okay. Give me one second here. I'm just changing a couple things over. Um, I want to show you one more thing before we move on to kind of the next topic here. Um, let's pull open my app server. So I have an app server that's sitting here at uh, 192.168.217.200. And uh, let's see here. And you can see it's listening on port 80. So it's doing a thing and we wanna make this uh, available. Actually, you know what? Let's do Nat Guest. Actually, I take that back. We're going to change hosts here. All right. Same thing, different host. It's listening to port 80, doing a thing. Um, I'm going to go back in to this virtual network editor. And what I want to do is I want to plumb this through so that something like my mobile phone or maybe a coworker's PC or something could actually get to the service that's running. Again, this VM is sitting on the NAT, the NAT network here. It may as well be behind, well, it's behind a logical segmentation. Right? It's running only on my machine. And the only access it has is through the, uh, the host. So I'm going to go ahead here, um, go into admin mode. There we go. Select my NAT network. And what did we say this was? This was... I, uh, 147.135. So I'm going to go ahead and, and do a port forward. So on my machine, I'm going to, I don't know, 8888, whatever, right? And it's going to be TCP and 147.135. Perfect. Okay. Now on the virtual machine, I want to forward port 80. And this is TAM. If I hit OK here and then OK here, you're going to see it's going to actually kind of halt the services for a second, put, put the config in. And now um, let's go to here. Host eight, 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 eight. OK. What you can see here, let me make it bigger. See if this works bigger. No. Nat guest. This is uh, it's running a Linux VM or a Linux distribution, right? We see Ubuntu up here, Nat guest, but I've plumbed it through to localhost. So you can use the Nat capabilities. Now the the implication here is, um, or the or I shouldn't say implication. The architecture decision here is if this is something that you want to do, it needs to exist on a virtual network type of NAT. If you want to make an internal host or an internal network, host only network of VM in there available, um, you'd have to use something like the, the, the PFSense firewall or some kind of service that's providing that for you, right? So if we look at, um, let's see, firewall, NAT, right, we could, we could do that too. Okay. So far, so good. The last thing I want to show off here is actually pretty cool. And it's a newish feature. I want to say it came out in version 16, where you can leverage VMware Workstation for containers. Has anybody heard of this? I don't know, raise your hand or come off a of mute and, and say, I've heard of it. It sounds cool or whatever. So where's the gain, Bill? What was that? I'm sorry? So where would there be a gain of, of, of 
doing, you know, like Kubernetes or Docker's inside workstation? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> a lot of it is, it's already there. You don't have to worry about the setup um, and things like that. By installing Workstation 16, you'll have access to it. So it's just, it's path of, you know, least resistance, right? It's already there. You can just focus on trying to deploy stuff with it. Okay. So let's hop over here. Kubernetes, or sorry, I shouldn't say Kubernetes. Containers isn't available through this UI. Um, instead, we have to start and manage the services from, um, from the, we'll just say from the command line. So program files, VMware, VMware workstation. And inside, inside this directory structure, there's a whole lot of stuff. There's a command VCTL. Command line tool for the container engine powered by Workstation, which is really, really cool. Now, um, let's run VCTL uh, system. So a little bit about what, what it's trying to do here, right? If you need to get to some logs, VCTL system info will show you where, where some of those are, right? Understand that, you know, kind of the virtual machines that it builds in the background to run these, it's going to have two cores, it's got some RAM, right, and things of that nature. This is another interesting one, which network is this going to join, right? We know that containers um, like to have that, that publicly facing um, IP address, at least so you can start getting to some services. May have said that, done that wrong. Let's see here. Hey, there we go. The first time you run this, it's actually going to go and pull down um, a, a couple things from the internet, specifically like uh, some VHDs or VHDs, uh, well, virtual hard drives or virtual disks for uh, the container platform, so Photon, things of that nature. So the first time you run it, it's going to take time you'll see the progress as it's downloading the components. But at this point now, we can actually, um, <laughs> we can actually run container workloads here. So let's do something here. Let's do VCTL uh, pull Nginx. All right, so again, the first time you run it, you're not going to have that. And it's going to go out to the repository and it's going to pull the bits down, which is really, really cool, right? Very much like Docker and things like that, right? This is um, very, very analogous. So now we can come in here and say VCTL uh, run, and I'm going to name it um, HamLab Nginx. All right, so now we can see like the performance on my disk kind of shot up a little bit, right? It's doing stuff as is uh, other things. My CPU is spiking, right, as these things are happening. So let's just go ahead and let this finish. Hey, there we go. VCTL describe uh, TAM lab. All right, so now we have some information about, um, about this, this container that's running. So we named it TAM Lab. We see that it's running, right? Um, I think what's really interesting here is this IP address, right? So if I wanted to go over here, it's uh, 147.130. 147.130. Welcome to Nginx. That's what we told the container to do, right? Is to download that, that well, that container and then actually start running it. Um, 
prior to come back here and uh, I'll stop. Um, I'll go ahead and stop. There we go. That service is not running. And now we see the little spinny wheel here and eventually it's gonna say connection timed out because that service isn't listening there anymore. Um, we didn't actually destroy the container, we just stopped it. So I'll go ahead and start it again. Let's let this start back up. Let it go. Has anybody here used this? So it's new to me, so I'll new check it out. Yeah, check it out. Um, I started to do it a little more and more. Um, as I'm trying to get a little more comfortable. This also lets you use kind. So if you're familiar with kind, um, you can leverage that for a bunch of orchestration as well. And we saw that in a previous uh, TAM lab uh, with Valero. So check that out too, um, if you want a little more exposure to kind. But this totally works with kind. Um, and so rather than just running a single container here or manually orchestrating that, you can leverage kind to get a little more uh, orchestration out of it. Cool. Let me here real quick, get out of it, perfect. Okay. Um, the last thing I wanna bring up as far as the containers here are concerned, whoop, launch another app. Um, is this runs as a service. And so you're gonna wanna maybe control the state sometimes. So VCTL stop, uh, system stop. So now there's nothing running. So again, controlling your resources, understanding what's going on is really important when you're using the same resources on your workstation. Um, any questions? Um, about my setup, you want to poke around anything, um, anything you're just yeah interested in. We still got we still have some time left. For the NAT, uh, you have it over there, uh, Bill. Mm -hmm. Do you create the default gateway or interface on your PF sense or uh, send it back to your router? The... Oh, for the NAT. Yeah. Um, so like the one that I set up with, uh, here. No, or, not the VM itself in the networking options. You have a oh. VM net, net. Yeah. Let me, yeah. Let me hop back over there. Let's, let's take a quick look. Edit network editor. So you're saying in here. Yeah, the default gateway, do you point it back to your PFSense so you can control the policies or? Yes, uh... I'm sorry, yes, that's exactly it. And with DHCP, you can do that um, if that's something you want, or you can disable, here, let me pull this up here. Um, well, let me look at ESXi real quick. So this is on 192, so the, the subnet here is 192. Um, so you can see here I disabled DHCP. So without PFSense running in the background, right? Handing out the services, it wouldn't get any IPs. So coming into PFSense then, I can come and configure uh, DHCP, right? To point to, this is the DNS server I want you to use. That's my domain controller, that virtual, the, the Samba 4 based one. Yep. Um, and it's gonna go ahead and use itself as the default gateway. Okay. And when you uh, spin your Windows machine, do you also connect it as a domain? Like, do you connect to the domain controller itself as well instead of workgroup? Um, you know, it depends on what I'm trying to accomplish. Uh, sometimes I just want to spin up a Windows machine to test like something goofy. So then no. Okay. Um, but there are times where like, let's say messing around with even possibly like a horizon thing. I absolutely do 
connected to it. Um, and depending on how I have it set up, um, I can have other services in my, my home lab connect to it as well. So just really depends on what I want to do, but gotcha. that domain controller is functional level 2008 R2 for what it's worth. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'll also call out too with that domain controller. Um, as with many things in our lab environments, it's not always supported uh, with things. And so um, for like LDAP queries and things like that, it works just fine for, um, for vSphere, but I've had it kind of lose its mind periodically and I would never want to put that into production. So keep that in mind, your mileage may vary. It works for some lightweight things, um, but I would definitely, you know, if you're doing even pre-prod, you want to make sure you're on properly supported stuff. Bill, you maybe want to check uh, the Q&A. We have a couple of questions for you there. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let's see here. Um, is the upstream, oh, conformant uh, Kubernetes? That's a really good question. I will have to say, I don't know. Um, the only time I'm aware that it gets updated um, from a Kubernetes perspective is when a patch is released um, for workstation. So I would probably say, I mean, I think it, I think it is compliant to a certain point, but it, it won't be the most up to date potentially, depending on what's going on. Um, and then is the alternative ADDNS stuff easy to set up? Yeah, it totally is. Um, in fact, we could actually do that here uh, in a second if somebody, if you want to stick around. Um, and then just to check, having Windows as a VM running on ESXi, can I still install Workstation then again, uh, then ESXi? I mean, that's a whole level of like inception where it's like Windows, ESXi, Windows, ESXi, things like that. Um, you might be able to. A lot of it comes down to the processor architecture that you have on your machine. So Intel versus AMD, the age of the CPU, right? And the functions and the features that it provides. Um, I know that in the past, there's been issues with like Ryzen, for example, supporting nested um, versus like Intel, um, you know, I series and things like that. So you could, I mean, you're going to start getting really weird. Um, as far as kind of keeping track of all of that stuff. But, um, you know, give it a shot. It could be a really, really interesting uh, exercise. Just try and keep things sized, right? Understand your ESXi host will probably have to be larger. Um, kind of at the base layer, you know, you have Windows or Linux and then ESXi, that'll probably be a larger one to run more workloads inside of that. Um, for anybody, you know, let's, let's just do this here real quick. Um, I'm going to wreck my lab because this is this is the fun part. Um, one second here. I'm going to go ahead and set up uh, the Samba stuff for you real quick. Uh, so this is going to be 147.135. 147.135. Um, sweet. So let me, I have, I have a little cheat sheet here. I just need to bring up on my other screen. Come on, there we go. So I have a GitHub, um, page repository that I can share, um, for any of those YouTube viewers, I'll put it in the comments, uh, for everybody else here. Um, I'll put it in chat. Permissions wise for it, um, I may have to make it public. We'll see, but here it is. You can see what I'm working with. Um, here we go. Can everybody see the screen okay, the content? Or do I need to make the text a little bigger? Yeah, I'll make it a little bigger if I'm asking. Yeah, a little bigger wouldn't work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I think we can answer that question. Let's do like 16. 
Hey, there we go. Okay. Um, you'd probably want to name your host something a little better than Nat Guest, but yeah, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to install some Samba stuff, some Kerberos, right? Um, all of these things. So let's go ahead and get that going. Yes, I want to get that. I'm not sure what this is. There we go. All right, and it's plugging on away. Nice part about this is really downloading all the little bits here is probably the takes the longest. Um, all right, so uh, db.info, that's my internal domain I use. Uh, and oh, this is uh, NatGuest. I'm doing stuff on the fly. I always have live demos. That's great. <laughs> if you didn't plan on doing, let's do it anyway. Um, let's finish this up. Okay. Um, so we're going to stop some services here and disable some services, and then we're going to move some. We're going to deal some with some config files. So you can see I'm disabling some of these uh, services. I, I wanna make sure they're off when I'm making these changes. Um, so I'm controlling the state. I'm being very intentional with, um, with what I'm doing here. All right, so let's go ahead and provision the domain. So again, a lot of these commands are done with Samba tool, which gets installed with a bunch of those packages we just did. So realm db.info, domain db. Okay, so are you a member of a domain? Samba 4 is completely compliant with Active Directory. You could have this join an existing domain if you wanted. Um, I'm just gonna say it's a domain controller. So the default is DC, we're just gonna keep it. Um, from a DNS perspective, I'm gonna keep Samba internal, but you could do cooler things with bind and um, you have to do all kinds of replication, things like that. But for me, Samba internal is perfect. Um, DNS forwarder, I'm gonna keep it as default. Administrator password, probably figure out what that is. And now it's kind of done, right? These are all things that we're really comfortable seeing, right? If you have any experience with Active Directory, right? Seeing like the domain said, um, seeing all of these other, like the, the, the SAM DB, right? All of these things showing up should probably make you feel really, really comfortable. Um, there's a couple more things here to do. Um, editing or moving Kerberos, right? There's a default um, Kerberos config that gets spit out. We're going to move it. And then we're going to uh, link to one that we just kind of configured by provisioning. Okay. Let's come over here. Again, controlling services, um, making sure that we're not going to step on, uh, on different kinds of toes. Uh, editing a Samba config here. So the DNS forwarder itself, I want this to forward um, to like, let's say Google, uh, four, two, two, one. Maybe that's not Google, I don't know who it is, but we're gonna set up that forwarding. There we go. Uh, and we're gonna start Samba. And this drives me nuts. Uh, the red text is okay. We're accustomed to seeing red meaning bad but red is good. We see it's active and running. There's one more service here. There we go. So that part's good. And now let's take a look at this. So we're gonna use Samba tool and we wanna perform some domain actions. There's other um, functions in Samba tool you can use, but we wanna just look at the domain level. And you can see that again, it's showing 2008 R2 is the functional level and the forest level, which is really, really good. Uh, oh, we're going to do it. We're going to, we're going to make it in time. Um, 
I'm going to go ahead and here and change uh, my DNS name server. Uh, what did we say the server was? This was 135. The search. Okay. Let's do some queries here. Okay. So we know DNS resolution is happening, right? It resolved the root domain vb.info. Um, pointing to itself, which is really, really good. And then let's look at some of these service records. Right again, if you're Active Directory, you know, hip, uh, seeing these service records, right, for uh, Kerberos and LDAP is very, very positive. I didn't do anything to set those up. That was done during the provisioning process. Um, and then let's take a quick look at Kerberos here itself. Let's see here. Okay, there we go. We see my password's going to expire in 14 days or 41 days. Um, I don't like that for my home lab. I'm going to go ahead and change that. So you can see here Samba tool domain password settings set max password age of 999 days. So now if we come back in. Oh my gosh, where are you? Um, now I went from 41 days to 998, right? So we're changing the, the administrator account here. Um, you know, if we wanted to create a user, we can create a user. User create vCenter, and here's a name, vCenter user. Got a user called vCenter. And if you want a group called ESX admins, you can create that too. And if you want to, there we go, added member. So I add, I created the vCenter user, I created a group called ESX admins, and now I added vCenter to ESX admins. All right, so all done from command line. If you want to do it on the Windows side, you can. Um, Last thing I'm gonna do here is just dump out some uh, DNS entries. They don't make any sense for this lab, but no, oh, that's fine. Yeah, see, this is what happens when you rush through these things. Um, but again, the command, right? Like uh, here's DNS, right? Oh yeah, see, vb.info. Yeah, see, I was rushing too fast. I didn't change the name of the domain controller. So these things are gonna start to fail. But Samba tool, DNS add, domain controller, zone, host name, record type, IP address. Same thing down here, right? Creating the reverse zone. So again, zone create, domain controller, reverse zone. And then the pointer records rely on that and, and everything else started losing its mind. But anyway, so that's that's that. Hopefully that helps. Um, cool. Last question here. Um, is it possible or difficult to scale out uh, this nested lab to another PC running uh, workstation? It starts getting weird when you wanna do that. Really comes down to the network architecture and um, this external connection. If I were to go add network, I'm just gonna pick one here, VMNet2. Let's take a look at that real quick. So VMNet2, what you would probably want to do, and you have to figure out how to make this work in your environment, go to bridged. When you go to bridged, you select the physical adapter that you want to use. 
So you'd have to have like another ethernet adapter or something like that potentially. You can pick that. Um, and assuming that was plugged into a switch that had access over to another one, you could, so you have to kind of mirror the configs and you could kind of do that. Um, but that's gonna take a lot of you know, troubleshooting on your side to do it. But really the, the key here is binding that, that effort right to a specific adapter and knowing that once you take that adapter, you can't use it for any of these other network types. So keep that in mind. Okay. Well, I know we're over by a couple minutes. Um, any other questions? All right, I hear crickets. Um, I really hope this was useful. You know, you don't have to have a major investment in hardware and cooling and, you know, your husband or your wife have to giving you permission to spend the money and make all that noise in your house, right? A lab is fully attainable with VMware Workstation and Fusion. Um, that's how I started with my first lab and it got me so far. It's amazing what you can do with it. So hopefully this was useful. Um, if you have any questions, you know, reach out. Um, otherwise, I appreciate everyone being on uh, today and running through this. And, uh, you know, thanks so much. And we'll see you at the next TAM lab.